is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Guy Johnson in London. And also joining us now, David Weston, anchor of Bloomberg Balance of Power, who is sitting down for an exclusive interview with U.S. Senator Pat Toomey. David. Thank you so much, Kaylee. So, Senator, thank you so much for being with us here Thanks in New York. So let's start with this uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, as yeah. they're, they're styling it. Yeah. And I guess my basic question is, you and I have talked before, you are concerned about the deficit. You're concerned about getting the deficit down. If you knew, if you believed this would do that, would you be in favor of it? No, not not doing it this way, and I'm very doubtful that this is actually going to accomplish that. <clears throat> if you look at what this consists of, David, right, it's a very significant corporate tax increase, mostly focused on manufacturers, which is a bad idea. It's combined with price controls on prescription drugs, which is both unnecessary and a very, very bad idea and a terrible precedent. And the money is mostly going to go to subsidizing corporate welfare for green energy companies, for wealthy people to buy Teslas, and for relatively affluent people to get a political payoff that's pretty blatant in the form of the subsidies for Obamacare for three more years. That's this package. And I've been asking myself, what does Joe Manchin get out of this? And of course, his answer is, oh, we're going to streamline the permitting process. Oh, really? We've seen no bill. We have no text. They're not putting it in this bill. And we have not identified the 10 Democrats that would have to join with 50 Republicans if there actually were a constructive permitting uh, expedition process. You know, exped uh, the process were expedited. And the fact is, most Democrats don't want to expedite permitting for fossil fuels. They want to keep it in the ground. They don't want to facilitate the infrastructure to move it around. So I am very, very dubious about so that. So let's come back to the to the deficit reduction part of it, because sure. the way they pencil out on something like $400 billion you produce over 10 years, you're questioning that yeah. as a practical matter. What in the math doesn't add up to you? So what I'm skeptical about, uh, a couple of things. First of all, I think the fact that they undo effectively undo one of the most constructive things we did in the 2017 tax reform, which is allow full expensing of CapEx, is going to lead to an economic slowdown. How constructive was that? Because I went back and looked at some of the numbers yeah. on Bloomberg, and, and the numbers bounce around on CapEx, but they didn't clearly go up under the 2017 uh, Act. I, I thought there was an increase, and I think there is an increase. And, and if you think about it, we lower the cost of capital expenditure, right? The after-tax cost goes down. If you lower the cost of something, all else being equal, it's it's likely that there'll be more of it. They're definitely going to raise the cost of CapEx, and that's why the Joint Tax Committee believes that half of this whole burden is going to fall on uh, manufacturers. Uh, so that's, that's one aspect. The other thing is they use this great Washington fiction of counting 10 years' worth of tax revenue increases against three years of expenditures in a program that they fully intend to be permanent. I'm referring to the Obamacare subsidies. You know, the way they pencil that in, it all goes away in three years. We know that's not going to happen, in part because the last time they did this, they extended it for two years. The two years is about up. So what are they doing? Right before the election, extended another three. That's going to continue. In fairness, when you talk about they, Republicans have been known to do that as well. There was some of that in the 2017 Act as well, as I recall. Uh, okay, both sides uh, have <laughs> been guilty of budget gimmicks from time to time. There's no question about it. Uh, but you asked me about this bill, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's enough. why I'm very doubtful. What about, about IRS that. enforcement? Why shouldn't we do what we can to make sure people pay their taxes? Uh, yeah, I, I think if it's done properly, you can defend that. I think the IRS does have antiquated systems, and, and there should be investment in upgrading that. But if it's going to be about harassing a lot of small business guys, uh, I, I'm not sure that's very constructive. You talked about tax gimmicks, and let's yeah. talk about the PACT Act. I have to always remember what it is. It's a promise to address comprehensive toxic acts. This right. is the burn pit Correct. issue, uh, yeah. and you've taken some issue with the bill as it is. Let's be clear. What are you for in this bill, and what are you against in this bill? That's a very good way to put it, right? So what I'm for is the entire set of provisions that will provide new and more generous benefits in health care and in disability compensation for veterans. So I've not suggested any change at all in the substance of what the bill is supposed to be about. And the changes that I'm looking for would not reduce spending on behalf of veterans by a penny anywhere throughout the entire federal government. What I'm against is a completely unrelated provision that was put into this bill. It's a very complicated technical change in the budget rules that makes it easier for future Congresses to spend more money. And it could be as much as $400 billion over the next 10 years. What I'm in favor of is keeping the budget rule as it's been 
for many, many years, not making that change that's completely unrelated to delivering benefits for veterans. My understanding is the other 400 uh, number here would be moving from discretionary to mandatory, but isn't that 400 number itself for various health benefits? That's What's wrong with making that mandatory? It, it, because it doesn't change the ability of the government to make those payments to cover those services. What This is an accounting change. This is a change in the way the government chooses to categorize the spending that's going to happen either way. If it is categorized as mandatory spending all of a sudden, which is the change that this bill would do to existing programs, the reason they want to do that is because it then frees up $400 billion underneath the spending caps that discretionary spending is subject to, and it allows for this spending spree on unrelated things. But doesn't Congress have the keys to its own jail there? I mean, when that came up, it can change those spending Con caps, can Con it not? Yes, so that is an argument that says, why have any budget rules? Because sure, Congress always has the keys. Congress can always undo anything. It can pass a new law. But we nevertheless do set up some guardrails in the hopes that that will provide some constraint on runaway spending. It hasn't worked real well. I'm not in favor of taking down what few guardrails we have. So you're taking a lot of hits on this, obviously, sure. in the press, John Stewart and others. How do you get out of this? How do you preserve what you think is important in this bill and still fix the problem you have? So, look, I, I don't know whether I'll be successful in getting rid of this extraneous gimmick for a spending spree, but what I've suggested is there's kind of an old-fashioned way to address this. Let's have a vote. <laughs> Let's see if there's a majority of the Senate that agrees with me or if a majority of the Senate disagrees with me. I'm going to have to live with that outcome, and that's what we ought to do. So I don't know whether Senator Schumer will allow that. He generally doesn't like votes on... Uh, on amendments as a, as a practical matter. Um, but if he'll agree to doing it here, then we get this resolved. And by the way, however it gets resolved, either way, the very next vote can be passage, which will get 85 votes. Uh, and, and if my amendment succeeds, I'll vote for it. So, so, Senator, finally, when you're talking about votes, uh, there also looks like there's likely to be a vote on that Inflation Reduction Act, right. as they call it. Uh, there seems to be one critical vote, maybe with Kristen Sinema from Arizona. Are you talking to her these days? I, I talk to Kristen very regularly. I, I'm, I consider her a friend. I think she's a great senator. I think she's very effective. She's very smart. Um, I think that her relative silence on this, unless I've missed something recently, um, is kind of conspicuous. I don't know what it means. I don't I'm not speculating about what she's going to do, but I do know there are some provisions in this deal that she has had reservations about in the past. So um, I'm looking forward to chatting with her this week about uh, what, she, what she thinks of it. And we'll look forward to hearing the results of that chat. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Senator. Great to have you with us. That's Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. Back to you, Guy Johnson.